It's a world where loyalty is paramount and respect is earned through deeds wrought in the crucible of danger. At the heart of this subculture lies one of its most iconic and feared entities, the Hells Angels. Since their inception, they've stood as a symbol of defiance, embodying the ethos of freedom and rebellion that captivates the imaginations of many. But within the ranks of the Hells Angels, there exists a select few whose names send shivers down the spines of even the most hardened individuals. What unfolds when we venture into the Untamen world of outlaw motorcycle culture, where the roar of Engenis and the clang of steel reverberity through the very fabric of society? Let's dive into the video. The recent shootout between the Hells Angels and a rival gang likely stems from long-standing tensions, potentially linked to retaliatory measures for past murders involving Hells Angels members. Law enforcement agencies have been tirelessly investigating the activities of the Hells Angels, aiming to dismantle their entire organizational structure. With a notorious history entrenched in criminal activities, the Hells Angels have earned a fearsome reputation globally, recognized by the FBI as one of the most violent motorcycle gangs. This notoriety is amplified by the notorious exploits of individuals within the organization. From drug trafficking to extortion, the Hells Angels have left an indelible mark on the criminal landscape. Their allure doesn't rely on active recruitment drives, but rather on attracting individuals who can contribute to their criminal enterprises, cementing their status as a formidable force within the underworld of motorcycle gangs. On top of the list, at number one we have Maurice Boucher, born on June 21, 1953 in Kozabskal, Quebec, Canada who rose from troubled beginnings to become one of the most infamous figures in the annals of motorcycle gang history. His trajectory into crime began as a means to support his drug habit, leading him to join the white supremacist motorcycle gang, the SS, in 1982. Despite a temporary setback due to a criminal conviction, Bouchy's entry into the Hells Angels in late 1987 marked the beginning of his ascent within the criminal underworld. Rapidly climbing the ranks, Bauche became president of the Montreal chapter by the early 1990s, wielding immense power and influence. His reign was characterized by ruthless endeavors in cocaine trafficking, loan sharking, and a relentless pursuit to dominate the drug trade in Montreal and beyond. The turning point came in 1994 when the arrest of Salvatore Cazetta, leader of the rival rock machine, presented Boucher with an opportunity to assert Hell's Angel's dominance. The ensuing Quebec Biker War, ignited by a series of violent confrontations between Hells Angels and Rock Machine, lasted eight years, claiming the lives of 162 individuals and leaving a trail of destruction with bombings and arson incidents. Boucher's ambition led him to establish the notorious Hells Angels Nomads chapter, further extending his grip on Quebec's criminal landscape. However, Boucher's brazen actions reached a tipping point when he ordered the random killings of Quebec correctional officers in 1997, aiming to intimidate the judicial system. Despite initial acquittal, subsequent legal maneuvers led to his rearrest and eventual conviction in 2002. Even behind bars, Boucher maintained his grip as one of Quebec's most feared crime bosses, facing charges for conspiring to assassinate alleged associates of the Montreal Mafia. Despite his defiance, Boucher's reign of terror met its end with his demise on July 10, 2022, succumbing to cancer in prison. His legacy remains a dark chapter in Hell's Angels history, a testament to the enduring power and brutality of organized crime. Although Boucher left the Mafia world, next on the list at number two we have David Wolf Carroll. Followed in his footsteps, known simply as Wolf, he emerged as one of the most formidable figures within the Hell's Angels, earning a reputation as Maurice Boucher's most trusted hitman. Born on April 1, 1952 in Dartmouth, Canada, Wolf's journey into the criminal underworld began with his affiliation with the biker gang, the 13th Tribe. However, it was his association with Boucher that propelled him into the inner circles of the Hell's Angels. Entrusted with overseeing drug operations in the Laurentians, Wolf swiftly rose through the ranks, solidifying his position as a key enforcer for the club. Rumored to have been involved in a staggering number of 15 murders, Wolf's criminal endeavors extended beyond mere violence. In the mid-1980s, he was caught running a prostitution ring in Montreal, though his stint in jail was brief. Despite brushes with the law, Wolf's intelligence and ruthlessness made him a prominent figure within the Halifax chapter of the Hells Angels, earning him the notorious Filthy Few patch, symbolizing his readiness to murder in service of the club's interests. 
During the height of the Quebec Biker War, Wolf harbored intense animosity towards the Rock Machine Gang, reportedly engaging in multiple killings targeting their members. He was also embroiled in personal feuds within the Hells Angels and involved in territorial disputes over drug trafficking. In 2001, as part of Operation Springtime, Wolf faced a significant legal blow when a warrant was issued for his arrest on 13 counts of first-degree murder. However, he managed to evade capture and disappeared, purportedly fleeing to Mexico along with fellow Hells Angels associates. Despite extradition requests, Wolf has remained at large for over two decades, evading authorities and continuing to elude justice. His ability to escape the long arm of the law stands as a testament to his cunning and determination, leaving a lingering shadow over the criminal landscape with the specter of his presence casting a chilling reminder of the enduring influence of organized crime. At number three, we have Paul Eichheide. Paul Eichheide led a double life as a clean-cut stockbroker by day and a member of the Hells Angels by night, eventually earning a spot on the U.S. Marshals' 15 most wanted list for his involvement in a brutal murder. On a fateful night in Mesa, Arizona, in October 2001, Cynthia Garcia found herself in the company of the Hells Angels at their clubhouse. In a drunken state, she began badmouthing the club and its members, enraging the bikers. The situation escalated quickly, leading to Garcia being brutally beaten and eventually murdered. Her body was found in the Arizona desert, bearing multiple stab wounds in a gruesome act of violence. Two years later, Operation Black Biscuit, a federal investigation, stormed into the Hells Angels chapter in Mesa, resulting in over a dozen members facing federal charges, including drug trafficking and conspiracy. The investigation eventually led to murder charges against two members implicated in Garcia's murder, one of whom was Paul Eyside. Despite the seriousness of the charges, Eyside managed to retain his steady job as a stockbroker, aided by his relatively clean criminal record. However, Eyside had no intention of facing justice. On July 29, 2004, he vanished removing his ankle monitoring bracelet and escaping the country with the help of a fake passport provided by another Hells Angel, Robert Eugene Tudiki. Aishide remained elusive until 2011, when Argentinian authorities finally apprehended him in Buenos Aires. During his arrest, authorities discovered a cache of false identification documents in his possession. Despite efforts to avoid extradition back to the United States, including a change.org petition garnering over 4,000 signatures, Izid ultimately returned to Arizona in 2018 to face charges related to Cynthia Garcia's murder. His story serves as a cautionary tale of the lengths individuals will go to evade justice and the eventual consequences they face when their actions catch up with them. Following, we have Adam Lee Hall on number four. Adam Lee Hall's reign of terror as a ranking member of the Massachusetts chapter of Hell Angels culminated in a brutal and senseless act of violence that shocked the community. In August 2011, Hall viciously attacked David Glasser with a baseball bat, prompted by suspicions of theft. Glasser, a responsible citizen, reported the assault to the authorities, leading to Hall's arrest on charges of assault, drug offenses, and illegal possession of firearms. As Glasser prepared to testify against Hall in court, tragedy struck. In September 2011, Glasser, along with his roommates Edward Frampton and Robert Chadwell, mysteriously vanished without a trace. Fearing for Glasser's safety due to his intention to testify against Hall, police launched an intensive investigation into the disappearances. After an exhaustive 11-day search, the horrifying truth was uncovered. The bodies of Glasser, Frampton, and Chadwell were discovered in a gruesome scene, their dismembered remains wrapped in plastic bags and buried in a pit. Autopsies revealed that they had endured unimaginable torture, including being gutted and shot. While Glasser was believed to be the primary target due to his planned testimony against Hall, Frampton and Chadwell were tragically caught in the crossfire, becoming victims of Hall's brutality. Adam Lee Hall, along with three accomplices, was swiftly brought to justice and handed life sentences without the possibility of parole for their heinous crimes. The case stands as a chilling reminder of the extreme lengths individuals like Hall will go to silence their victims and evade accountability for their actions. The community mourned the loss of Glasser, Frampton, and Chadwell, their lives tragically cut short by the merciless violence of a remorseless criminal. The case of the Altamont Speedway Free Festival of 1969 comes next on number five. 
intended as a celebration of counterculture and music, took a harrowing turn when the Hell's Angels, tasked with maintaining order, descended into chaos. Despite the presence of renowned musicians like Jefferson Airplane, The Grateful Dead, and The Rolling Stones, security arrangements were far from adequate. Instead of professional security or law enforcement, organizers struck a deal with the Hell's Angels, offering them $500 worth of beer in exchange for crowd control. Positioned in front of the stage, the Angels initially used their motorcycles as barriers to prevent the audience from getting too close. However, as the day progressed and the alcohol flowed, the situation escalated. Intoxicated Hell's Angels began hurling full beer cans and attacking concert goers with motorcycle chains and weighted pool cues. By the time the Rolling Stones took the stage, tensions had reached a boiling point. Fights erupted between the Angels and the audience, plunging the festival into a state of tense hostility. Amidst the chaos, Denise Jukes, a local band member, suffered a skull fracture after being struck by a thrown beer bottle underscoring the violence permeating the event. The most tragic incident occurred when Meredith Curley Hunter, amidst the tumult, brandished what appeared to be a revolver. In response, Hell's Angel Alan Passaro charged at Hunter armed with a knife. Passaro deflected the gun and proceeded to stab Hunter multiple times, fatally injuring him. Despite his arrest and subsequent murder charge, Passaro escaped prison time, with the jury accepting his defense of acting in self-defense. However, rumors circulated that the clash between Hunter and the Hell's Angels stemmed from racial prejudice, with Hunter being targeted simply because he was a black man with a white companion, highlighting the Angels' history of mistreating people of color. The Altamont tragedy stands as a chilling reminder of the perils of inadequate security arrangements and the potential for violence when organized crime infiltrates public events. The events of that day serve as a sobering cautionary tale revealing the deadly consequences of allowing lawlessness and unchecked aggression to prevail. Get ready for a chill down your spine as we move forward on number six. George Weathern's entanglement with the Hells Angels led to a series of tragic events that would ultimately change the course of his life forever. Rising through the ranks to become the vice president of the chapter, Weathern's close friendship with President Sonny Barger solidified his position within the organization. Even after leaving the Hells Angels in 1970, Weathern remained connected to many members, showcasing the enduring grip the club held over its affiliates. However, the dark shadow of Weathern's past resurfaced when three bodies were discovered on his sprawling ranch near Akaya in Northern California. Rumors swirled that the property, allegedly purchased with club funds but registered under Weathern's name, served as a grim burial ground for those who crossed the wrong paths. The motive behind this gruesome act allegedly stemmed from a debt owed by Wethern to another angel, William Mitten, whom Wethern had reportedly shot at a party in 1969 while under the influence of drugs. The bodies found on Wethern's ranch included a young woman shot in the head and two Hells Angels, purportedly attempting to stage a coup within the club. Former angel-turned-informant, Piper, shed light on the murders revealing that the victims were given cups of coffee laced with LSD before meeting their demise. In exchange for immunity, Piper cooperated with authorities, leading to a raid on Weathern's ranch where drugs, weapons, and bodies were discovered. Facing arrest, Weathern chose to become a state witness, offering testimony against his former brothers in exchange for immunity. Alongside his wife and children, Weathern entered the Witness Protection Program, his whereabouts currently unknown. Despite the risks, he penned a revealing book titled Wayward Angel, offering insights into his life with the Hell's Angels and his decision to testify against his fellow members. Weathern's journey serves as a cautionary tale of the consequences of entanglement with organized crime and the difficult choices faced when loyalty clashes with justice. Moving towards number seven, the year 1985 marked a dark chapter in the history of Quebec. As a quiet town in the eastern townships, became the backdrop for a shocking and brutal event. The notorious Hells Angels, operating out of their bunker nestled on a wooded hill near Sherbrooke, summoned five members of their now-defunct Laval chapter, only to mercilessly slaughter them. This heinous act, known as the Lennoxville Purge, sent shockwaves through the province, forever etching its place in Quebec's history. The intended targets of the massacre, two other members of the Laval chapter, narrowly escaped their fate by failing to attend the ill-fated meeting. 
However, their comrades' lives were callously extinguished and their bodies were disposed of in a river, wrapped in sleeping bags, and weighed down with cinder blocks and weights. The sheer brutality of the Lennoxville Purge stunned the nation and underscored the ruthlessness of the Hells Angels' grip on Quebec's criminal underworld. Rather than signaling the downfall of the Hells Angels in Quebec, the Lennoxville Purge paradoxically served to strengthen their presence in the years that followed. In the aftermath of the massacre, the Hells Angels formed strategic partnerships with other criminal organizations such as the West End Gang and the Mafia. Recognizing the need for professionalism in their illicit dealings, the Hells Angels engaged in multi-million dollar drug deals, understanding the importance of minimizing mistakes to protect their lucrative enterprises. The Lennoxville Purge thus marked a pivotal moment in the Hells Angels' evolution in Quebec, as they consolidated their power through alliances with other criminal entities. Despite the gruesome nature of the massacre, it served as a stark reminder of the cold, calculated approach the Hells Angels took in pursuing their criminal enterprises. The events of 1985 left an indelible scar on Quebec's landscape, a testament to the enduring influence and ruthlessness of organized crime. Next at number eight, we have April 7, 1985, marked another tragic chapter in the annals of Hells Angels violence as Claude Roy, linked to the Laval chapter, fell victim to the gang's merciless code. Michelle Janet Janelle, implicated in the Lennoxville Purge, confessed to Roy's murder during his testimony. According to Janelle, Roy violated the Hells Angels' strict rules against hard drugs and was suspected of being a police informant, leading to his brutal demise. Amidst the backdrop of escalating violence and power struggles within the Quebec criminal underworld, one figure loomed large, Yves Apache Trudeau. A founding member of Popeye's biker gang, which later merged with the Hells Angels in 1977, Trudeau was a formidable force in the realm of drug trafficking and contract killings. In the early 1970s, the Popeyes, in alliance with the Dubois brothers, engaged in intense clashes with rival biker gangs, emerging victorious and asserting control over the drug trade in their territory. Following the merger with the Hells Angels, Trudeau ascended to the position of paramount leader of the Quebec chapter. Charged with expanding the gang's influence and criminal activities across Canada, Trudeau faced formidable adversaries, notably the Montreal North chapter led by Yves Le Beauce Bedard. Concerned about the disruptive behavior of the Montreal North members, Trudeau and his cohorts made the fateful decision to eliminate the rival chapter, culminating in the Lennoxville massacre in March 1985, where five members met their end. At number nine on this list lies the enigmatic figure of Eva Pachi Trudeau, whose life journey embodies a descent into darkness and infamy. Born on February 4, 1946, Trudeau's path took a sharp turn towards the criminal underworld, where he carved out a notorious reputation as an outlaw biker and contract killer, earning him a spot among Canada's most infamous serial killers. Trudeau's rise to prominence within the Hells Angels saw him embroiled in numerous biker conflicts, including Popeye's Devil's Disciples War, the Satan's Choice Popeye's War, and the Quebec Biker War. However, beneath the facade of his criminal exploits lay a tumultuous inner struggle fueled by cocaine addiction and paranoid suspicions of betrayal from his fellow gang members. The zenith of Trudeau's criminal career arrived in 1985 with the harrowing Lennoxville Massacre, a watershed moment that shook the nation to its core. Following this event, Trudeau made a fateful decision to become a crown witness, providing crucial insights into organized crime activities in exchange for a reduced sentence. Despite his cooperation, Trudeau received a life sentence with the possibility of parole after seven years. Yet, Trudeau's taste of freedom proved ephemeral. In 1994, he found himself incarcerated once again after assaulting a young boy, resulting in an additional four-year prison term. Tragically, in 2006, Trudeau's life took a final somber turn with a diagnosis of bone marrow cancer. Despite battling the disease, Eva Patchy Trudeau's story serves as a stark reminder of the perilous path paved by violence, addiction, and paranoia. His life, marked by a journey from obscurity to infamy, underscores the tragic consequences of a life entangled with the criminal underworld. Moving towards number 10 as we peek into the past. Before the arrival of the Hells Angels in Arizona, the state was under the dominion of the Dirty Dozen Motorcycle Club, led by the infamous Robert Chico Mora. 
renowned as the most ruthless and feared biker gang in the region, the Dirty Dozen struck terror into the hearts of law enforcement and locals alike with their black and white patches. Shootouts, drug use, and wild parties were commonplace occurrences, solidifying the gang's reputation for chaos and violence. In 1977, the Dirty Dozen made a momentous decision to align themselves with the Hells Angels, a move orchestrated by Chico Mora himself. Advocating for the merger, Mora aimed to unite his fellow members with the larger worldwide brotherhood of the Hells Angels. His reputation for ruthlessness and criminal activities preceded him, earning both respect and notoriety within biker circles. Despite a manslaughter conviction in 1980 stemming from a shooting incident and a lengthy rap sheet comprising drug trafficking and illegal weapons possession, Mora's stature as a feared biker remained unshaken. Mora's legend within the club was defined by his physical strength, involvement in fights, and intimidating presence. He was known to command respect and instill fear in equal measure, with tales circulating about his willingness to confront any adversary, be it man or beast, without hesitation. His uncompromising demeanor and brutal nature solidified his status as a legendary figure within the biker community. On January 1st, 2014, Chico Mora passed away, marking the end of an era in Arizona's biker scene. His funeral served as a poignant testament to his influence, drawing a large gathering of Hell's Angels who paid their respects to a man who had left an indelible mark on the region's criminal underworld. Though his passing signaled the conclusion of his earthly existence, Chico Mora's legacy as a formidable and unforgettable presence in Arizona's biker culture endures, leaving behind a complex and enduring narrative of power, violence, and brotherhood. On number 11, we have an incident that occurred on January 10th, 2014. Tragedy struck at The Bookies to Heroes, a venue in Berlin, as 26-year-old Tahir Beck's life was abruptly cut short. Security cameras captured the harrowing events as 13 men, some masked, surreptitiously entered through the back entrance. Amidst the chaos, one assailant brandished a gun and unleashed a hail of eight bullets, six of which fatally struck Tahir, leaving him lifeless on the spot. The swift and brutal nature of the attack left bystanders reeling, but it also provided crucial evidence for law enforcement to apprehend the perpetrators. Investigations swiftly revealed that the orchestrator of this heinous act was none other than Kadir Padir, the leader of the Hells Angels in Berlin. Padir had ordered the hit as retribution for Tahir's prior stabbing of one of his crew members, a nightclub bouncer named Alexander Plotz, in October 2013. This act of vengeance underscored the ruthless ethos of the Hells Angels, whose reach extended beyond mere territorial disputes to exacting swift and merciless justice against those who crossed them. In the ensuing legal proceedings, Padir and ten others were convicted of Tahir's murder, with seven individuals found guilty of committing the crime together, including Padir himself. The trial laid bare the extent of the Hells Angels' influence and brutality, highlighting their readiness to resort to violence, to settle scores and maintain their dominance in the criminal underworld. The chilling incident at the Bookies to Heroes serves as a stark reminder that the Hells Angels' ruthlessness knows no bounds, with their propensity for violence extending even to acts of retribution against perceived adversaries. In a world where loyalty and vengeance reign supreme, the tragic loss of Tahir Beck stands as a sobering testament to the lethal consequences of crossing paths with the Hells Angels, a formidable force that brooks no opposition, even within their own ranks. Next, at number 12, comes the harrowing case of Jasmine. Wilson's tragic death unveils a disturbing narrative of domestic violence and familial complicity, with her boyfriend, Zane Piora Wallace, at the center of the horrors. Beginning with Jasmine's grim hospitalization, where she lay barely recognizable, covered in bruises and multiple fractured ribs, it became evident that her suffering had been prolonged and severe. The severity of her injuries shocked even seasoned police officers, with one describing them as among the worst he had ever witnessed. The perpetrator of this appalling violence was none other than Wallace, a member of the Hells Angels chapter in New Zealand. His history of violence, including previous convictions for assaulting partners, underscored a pattern of abusive behavior that culminated in Jasmine's tragic demise. 
The cycle of abuse began in November 2018 when Wallace subjected Jasmine to a terrifying ordeal, forcing her to pull over while driving and brutally assaulting her, marking the inception of a nine-month nightmare. Wallace's reign of terror extended beyond Jasmine as he also targeted one of her acquaintances and assaulted two individuals at a party shortly before his arrest for Jasmine's murder. Despite spending significant time behind bars throughout 2019, Wallace shamelessly made threats against Jasmine and her family during recorded prison phone calls, demonstrating a chilling disregard for the consequences of his actions. The fatal attack on Jasmine occurred on July 30, 2019, following a heated argument that escalated into a vicious assault. Wallace unleashed a barrage of punches upon Jasmine, leaving her incapacitated and defenseless. The following day, he repeated the brutality, causing Jasmine to lose consciousness after her head violently collided with a wall. In a twisted turn of events, Wallace enlisted the help of his father, Stephen Wallace, to conceal the evidence of his crimes. Operating as a disturbing family affair, Stephen Wallace, Zane's mother, Leanne Wallace, and sister, Stevie Lee Wallace, collaborated in a desperate bid to obstruct justice. Together, they orchestrated a cover-up, misleading hospital staff and law enforcement about the circumstances of Jasmine's injuries, aiming to throw investigators off their trail. However, their efforts proved futile as justice eventually prevailed. In the aftermath of Jasmine's tragic death, Wallace's parents and sister faced legal consequences for their roles in attempting to conceal the crime, highlighting the depths of depravity within the Wallace family. Ultimately, Wallace himself received a life sentence with a minimum term of 15 years and six months, serving as a somber conclusion to a tale marked by cruelty, manipulation, and the devastating impact of domestic violence. Ever felt goosebumps? Get ready to get those again as we reach the end with the events surrounding the murder of Joel Silva, a Hells Angels member, on number 13. During a motorcycle event in Laconia, New Hampshire, paint a grim picture of betrayal and vengeance within the tight-knit brotherhood of the Hells Angels. It all began with a heated confrontation between Silva, a Sonoma Charter member, and a fellow member from the Salem Charter, which caught the attention of Jonathan Nelson. The president of the Fresno Charter, Brian Wayne Went, the president of the Salem Charter, and Russell Taylor Ott, the president of the Sonoma Charter. Feeling that Silva's disrespectful act needed to be met with severe consequences, the trio of Jonathan Nelson, Rusty Ott, and Brian Went devised a chilling plan. On July 15, 2014, Silva was lured to the Fresno Hells Angels Clubhouse under pretenses where he met a tragic end at the hands of Brian Went, who coldly shot him in the back of the head. Silva's body was subsequently cremated while his truck was set ablaze, erasing any evidence of the gruesome crime. The motive behind Silva's murder, as revealed during the trial in 2022, was tied to his alleged involvement in an affair with Raymond Fox's wife. Fox, a long-standing member of the club with a notorious criminal past, held significant sway within the Hells Angels Brotherhood the trio of Nelson, Ott, and Went felt compelled to avenge Fox's honor, leading to the brutal and calculated execution of Silva. Following their confession and conviction for Silva's murder, Jonathan Nelson, Rusty Ott, and Brian Went were sentenced to life in prison, serving as a stark reminder of the unforgiving consequences of betrayal and vengeance within the confines of the Hells Angels Brotherhood. Locked away in the depths of prison, they stand as a chilling testament to the brutal lengths some will go to uphold the code of loyalty and honor within their criminal organization. In conclusion, the saga of the 13 most dangerous Hells Angels in history is not merely a recounting of individual lives, but a tapestry woven from the fabric of rebellion, power, and infamy. From the notorious exploits of Maurice Boucher to the strategic cunning of David Wolf Carroll, and from the ruthless violence of Paul Eastside to the calculated schemes of Adam Lee Hall, each figure has left an indelible mark on the annals of outlaw motorcycle culture. Their stories serve as cautionary tales, illustrating the perils and allure of a life lived on the fringes of society. Yet, they also stand as a testament to the human spirit's capacity for resilience, adaptability, and unyielding determination in the face of adversity. As we reflect on the lives and legacies of these formidable individuals, 
we are reminded that within the shadows of danger and darkness, there exists a complex tapestry of motivations, aspirations, and emotions. While their actions may have left a trail of destruction and chaos in their wake, they also serve as a mirror through which we can examine the darker aspects of our humanity. Ultimately, the tales of the 13 most dangerous Hells Angels in history compel us to confront uncomfortable truths about power, loyalty, and the pursuit of freedom. They challenge us to question our assumptions, to reckon with the complexities of morality, and to recognize that the line between hero and villain is often blurred in the harsh light of reality. As we bid farewell to these enigmatic figures, their stories linger on as a reminder of the enduring allure of rebellion and the timeless allure of the outlaw. And though their names may fade into obscurity with time, their legend lives on in the hearts and minds of those who dare to venture into the untamed wilderness of the human experience. And that's it for today. Make sure to like and subscribe to our channel.